All right, welcome to another experimental Emacs Hangout. Today is April 15, 2015, and uh, we have a whole bunch of, you know, um, well, people on the line. If you're viewing this, you can look at the event page for the URL to click on so that you can join. Um, if you have questions, you can always submit them through the text chat. If you are in the chat, you can also speak up and just say things, or you can leave a comment on the um, on the event page, and I can keep a look keep a look out for those. Uh, deal with those. So basically an Emacs Hangout is a bunch of us just hanging out and talking about Emacs, whether you've got this cool thing that you discovered and you want to share with other people, or you're wondering how other people would solve something or write Emacs list to solve something, anything is fair game. A um, couple of other housekeeping things. The next one is on April 30, so the event page will have a link to the next one as well. And um, uh, and then we can just kick it off with a quick round of introductions. If you say who you are and where you, you're from, sometimes that means other people will go, holy cow, there's another Emacs user in, insert obscure city here, um, and then organize a meetup. So I'm Sasha Chua. I am based in Toronto. Let's go, uh, let's go like in order of the people I can see here. Dylan. OK, I'm, I'm Dylan Fideke. I'm from Australia, as you can probably tell from the accent. Probably the only Emacs user within a few hundred kilometres. Um, <laughs> I'm a I'm a system administrator, IT consultant, and I'm a Linux man who works on a Mac and I maintain Windows systems. So I'm a bit schizophrenic in that way, I suppose. But that's me. That's okay. I'm on Windows too. Um, so yeah, uh, Howard. Oh, I didn't know <laughs> which way it was. But yes, I'm Howard. I am uh, from uh, Portland, Oregon. There's another Howard also, so this is slightly confusing. But the other Howard can now introduce oh, himself. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. No, no, I'm no, I've actually met you. Howards around. I do, uh, but yes, now but now we have another Howard, so we will disambiguate you some other way. Um, <laughs> but yes, second Howard. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm all... I'm new to all this. I'm in Boston, although I'm a very long time Emacs user. Um, but I haven't been using it extensively for programming in a while, so I'm new to a lot of the new packages. Cool, cool. Ian? Sorry, was that me? Yes. Hey, guys. I'm Ian. Uh, American, actually living in Tokyo. I'm working as a uh, game developer in the Japanese games industry. I'm a freelancer right now. And before uh, hopping over here, I was based in California for the better part of a decade. Um, long time, kind of casual Emacs user. I'm the proverbial intermediate user, I guess. Um, but lots of old, terrible workflows that I like to improve. And uh, since going freelance about a year ago, I've really started in on just trying to master my tools a little bit better and you know, trying to use Emacs a little more efficiently and uh, a little more smart. So it's part of why I'm here. Awesome. And Sean? Uh, I'm also in, I'm Sean, I'm also in Toronto, um, yes, also sort of the proverbial intermediate user, I've been um, looking at doing more and more in, in org mode and uh, enjoying it, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm eager to pick up more tips and information. So. All right, and Zachary? Hey, I just uh, got in. What are we uh, talking about? We're doing the quick round of introductions, name, location, and other interesting things about what you want to learn. I don't know. Stuff like that. Uh, cool. Um, so I'm Zachary. I'm in New York City. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm interested in org mode. I've been kind of starting to pick up more about it. Um, recently started using uh, org agenda after the last one of these. Um, that's been pretty cool. Um, Oh, also the uh, I I've been going to the New York uh, Emacs meetup a lot, and one of the co-founders just left, so they asked me to step up as one of the co-organizers of that. So you should come to it if you're local. <laughs> Good for you. Awesome. Wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're you know kind of making things up with a virtual hangout because uh, yeah. uh, New York is like an eight-hour bus trip, which is still a bit much. Although uh, I don't know, it's cool. Um, and speaking actually of physical get-togethers, uh, this Emacs conference idea thing, some in some time, maybe August or later, depending on how things work out, might actually happen since a bunch of other people, including Samra Masterson, have actually started doing the proper organizer things of 
looking for potential venues and sponsors and whatever. I'm still definitely going to, you know, I, I want to have a live stream, at least for the rest of us who can't really travel around the world or whatever, don't like doing so. Um, but hey, who knows? It might actually happen this year. All right. So one of the key the ideas... Still be doing okay. a, uh, are you still thinking of having some of the presenters be virtual or just all I of I do, because there's so many interesting people. Um, and one of the things that I want to do with it is I, w I want it to be a, a good excuse for us to record demos and walkthroughs and, and, and quick, like, this is, this is where Emacs is now. These are the cool things. These are the inspiring things that you can do with it. That was one of the things I really liked about the Emacs conference in 2013. And... And these these hangouts, you know, you get a you get a peek into how other people have have built things, the possibilities of it. Um, and I'm hoping that that you know, no matter where people are, it, and even if they can't make it on that day, we can always schedule some other time to have a hangout like this to have that snapshot of where Emacs is. Agreed. Yeah, keep it going. I'm looking forward to it. Yes. So this is this is mainly for uh, uh, convincing all the people who can't be bothered to write blog posts, which is one of my personal crusades to get more Emacs leaks writing blog posts and uh, doing videos and <laughs> coming on Hangouts and stuff like that. Anyway, um, sure. there were a couple. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, uh, Sh Sean is laughing because I make him write blog posts about stuff. Um, okay, so one of the since a couple That's of people a mentioned being local there, Sean, you need to move away. I know. <laughs> but workflow improvements was one of the things that a couple of people were interested in. And at the last Emacs Hangout, we briefly talked about the idea of like having people voluntarily put themselves in the hot seat, maybe demonstrate their workflow, um, and other people can pick up tips, or other people can offer tips. Now, is this something people are brave enough to experiment with today? <laughs> you don't have to have like a formal presentation or anything. You might just say, you know, this is this is a thing that I do like ten times a week, and it's driving me crazy. I so. could do some limited stuff. I don't have uh, non-proprietary code prepared much, but I think I've got one or two open source things that I could show. Just kind of some pain points. Awesome. If you want to share your screen, there's a thing on the left side when you hover over the Google Plus window. Um, it's a green monitor icon with an arrow pointing to the right. See it? I'm clicking it. It's my first time at a Hangout. Let me see if I can figure this out. All right. This top one looks promising. All right. I can see your desktop. You see my screen? Excellent. Let's switch over here. So um, let me do, I'll do a really quick example, I guess, just to start with. Uh, let's get out of org mode. Let's use some random game project. Um, so I work in a lot of different languages. Uh, since I do freelancing, I've got different clients I work with. So I'm in Unity and Android, uh, doing server dev, all kinds of stuff like that. And one example of a common pain point for me in game dev is there are a lot of environments and a lot of platforms that are really tied to their own IDE or their own editor. So things like if you're building for consoles, you're in Visual Studio all the time. If you're in Unity, they've got their own editor. Android, you're going through Eclipse. iOS, you're going through Xcode. Blech. Um, you know, besides Visual Studio, I'm not really a huge fan of any of them, um, although Unity isn't really an IDE, I guess, but they've got their own silly scene editor thing. So as one per really quick example, um, you know, something where you might expect to say, okay, I'm going to make a code change here, blah, 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 you know, save, compile, and, you know, probably get my output in another buffer here on the side, for example. Um, but when I'm forced to go through an IDE, I end up with a workflow where it's like, okay, I'm alt-tabbing over to Unity, for example, taking those code changes I just put in, and if I'm lucky, I can get all, get all the way through, through with keyboard shortcuts, but it's still not great. At the end of the day, I'm still hitting play here and saying, okay, here are my tests running. Cool, I get to see the results from that code change that I just made. So that's one silly contrived example. Um, and I feel like for really simple systems development where you're not really doing you know 3D stuff and editing scenes and stuff like that, I should be able to get it a lot more like doing make at the command line um, and you, being able to wrap that in a way like Unity could. And lots of these editors have batch modes, um, and a lot of it is just that I haven't actually made the steps to go out and say, okay, I'm going to write a mode um, or write a few simple functions to actually wrap that uh, in a shell and bind it to a few keystrokes in Emacs. Um, so a lot of it admi admittedly is laziness on my part rather than ignorance, uh, but some of it's ignorance too. So that's, you know, re repeat that for 
uh, not really Visual Studio, but repeat that for Xcode and uh, you know working in Objective C. Repeat that for uh, Java or Android development working in Eclipse or Android Studio, which is one of the bigger uh, pain points for me, I guess, just in terms of integration and uh, coding in Emacs overall. And you know that's that's one of the big ones for me. So does anyone have any suggestions? How about the compile command? Is that something that you use? I haven't in many years. Um, most of the languages that I work with recently, far as I know, don't have decent support. Um, I've tried in Java pulling up, uh, working with like Eclim or uh, the Setit package and whatnot, and most of those I'll bang my head against for a day and then just bounce off of and give up pretty much, particularly Java. I feel like there's a lot of friction getting in, you know, and that kind of get, getting over that initial hump, and it's never really gotten there for me. Whereas I've gotten to a decent setup with, for example, Ruby or Python, you know, kind of the more terse uh, dynamic languages. Those I've had a good time with, JavaScript as well. Um, but, you know, the bigger nasties like C Sharp and Java in particular have always given me issues. What operating system are you typically running on? Uh, nowadays, usually I'm on Mac OS. Stop screen sharing. Because uh, run um, I've used Windows quite a bit in the past, too. Um, usually, most of it's on Mac OS, since I'm doing a good amount of server development, and that lets me cover server and client pretty easily. Yeah, because, um, you know, I kind of run the same sort of thing with, well, just about everything is that way anyway. Um, but what, I, what I've done is hook the save mode up to kick off programs like compiles and, sure. you know, that sort of stuff. So just hooking in a hook like that may help as well. Mm. Yeah, and I think uh, par part of it also is that, uh, at least on the client side, there's a little bit more on the server side, but, like, client side game developers and Emacs is a pretty rare cross-section, I think, just because there's friction like this. A lot of people yeah, just sure. use whatever editor is tailored to their platform. Uh, so I'm a weirdo, I guess, in that regard. Um, but uh, part of that may be an opportunity. You know, I, that means there's not a lot of stuff out there, and it may be easy for me to get a few small wins by writing, for example, simple bindings for the Unity editor to actually kick off builds and things like that. And it's just not something I've had the... Uh, honestly, I've had the time. I just haven't gotten off my ass and done it. So I should probably do that. Sure. I'm looking at this uh, previous Emacs chat that I had with Yanis Manchevich, um, and he was talking to me about org, uh, org mode and literate programming with it with the export out to Unity. But he was doing what what you you basically showed, where you edit it in Emacs and you just alt tab or whatever to uh, to switch to the to Unity workspace because then that I guess recompiles it or whatever. Yeah, and I. I... I know it's absolutely doable because they've got a batch mode that you can use, like in you know continuous integration systems and whatnot. So it's absolutely a thing. It's something I could plug in. I just need to do it. It's probably fairly simple. But yeah, at the same at the same time, you know, again, you know, independently of Unity and game dev specifically, for me, just kind of you know the big C sharp. Yeah, C sharp and Java, and in particular, you know, I every now and then I feel like every three or four years I come back to Java and Emacs and go like, okay, has anything happened that I've missed? Has it, you know, is it somehow easy and doable now? And the answer is always no. You know, I end up taking a day and just throwing my hands up and going back to the old workflows. Does anyone here have to deal with Java? How do you spell that? <laughs> J-A-V-A. <laughs> Not B-B-A. <laughs> well, sometimes it feels like it. I have I did a long time ago, but at the time I was just using make and compile and it all worked pretty well. Yeah, with a lot of the build tools like with Maven and whatnot, um, kicking off a Maven command to go execute things or even in closure with line, this sort of stuff. Uh, yeah, if you could just get that one thing running. Um, I pasted in the chat a link to, because I've run across this so many times, that I finally just started investigating save mode hooks and that sort of stuff so that I could just have each of my projects kick off a, you know, some sort of a script where I could put that sort of stuff in. I don't know if that could help out or not. 
I see your blog post. I'll take a look. It's going in the bookmarks. I have okay. a little save mode hook just for Emacs Lisp mode to recompile a file whenever I save it. I don't know if I'd want to do it for a large Java project for each file I save, but uh, you know, having having MX compile on a key binding was pretty easy. Oh, true, true enough, true enough. Yeah, and and tying that way, that may be another hook. I mean, there's so many hooks uh, to throw something fun on. Um, I just pasted in the, the chat a uh, link to Guard Java. When I work in Ruby, sometimes I'll use Guard, so it, it monitors the file changes. It's outside Emacs, um, so it monitors the file changes, and it kicks off whatever compiler or, in my case, testing cycles that I need. So that might be a, a different approach to try as well, you know, to have an external process monitoring file changes and kicking off your compiles. Yeah, that's cool. And you said you looked at the current state in Emacs, but the old one, at least, that was always being developed, and I just looked, still is, I guess, was JDEE, was the Emacs IDE for Java? Yeah, I've, uh, that's J JDEE and uh, set it usually. I end up both pulling in and trying yeah. and just falling over. I don't know yeah. what it is. I guess that's if you if you want like the the IDE type IntelliSense autocompletion type things. Yeah, that wouldn't hurt. <laughs> I mean, for me, the only thing I really, really ever wanted was compile and enough so that next error worked and could bring up a file. You know, the, the error in the line number. Mm -hmm. And that should work pretty easy just from any Java compiler. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just kind of around the project bindings. In my experience, you know, making sure all the li the libraries that are supposed to be tied in are tied in and whatnot. Um, and so, yeah, I think for you know doing a simple command line build probably wouldn't have an issue. But when I'm depending on, you know, I've I've got a client who's got an Eclipse project that I have to try and figure out how to deal with, and it gets nastier. I think that may be a big part of it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I'll I'll try taking another look there. And yeah, another another one also I forgot to mention is. Uh, I'm always bad about uh, company mode is another one where I never quite get all the way out to the edges in terms of getting it working with the odd language. Um, you know, C++, very easy. Uh, C Sharp haven't gotten there. Java haven't gotten there, but I'd love to. And I've, uh, I've I, again, haven't spent enough time. But uh, if anyone knows of someone with a good working setup, I would love to copy. Or I can just get off my ass for that one too. <laughs> it looks like uh, quite a few people have posted some packages or uh, or configs related to C sharp in Emacs. Uh, da -da -da -da. There's one like if you have an OmniSharp server, it, you can do things. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's not a, it's not a language I have much experience in. <laughs> it's not a bad language. I have some things to say about the framework it runs on, but the language itself is pretty cool. <laughs> okay. I'm, actually, I'm digging through the guard links from uh, from chat. I need to play with it. I never have. Cool. All right. I've got my so, action uh, items at least. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> so I'll dig in. It, it it can be really uh, frustrating sometimes. You know, you're you're trying to piece things together from documentation and other people's blog posts, and you're like, it's just like not quite there. So it's done um, a lot better recently. You know, I think the wave in the past few years of people actually sharing solid config setups and you know doing either with or without literate programming has made it a lot easier to learn. Uh, for for me personally, uh, I've used Emacs for about 15 years, and not until the very p past year did I go back and really take a hard look at my init setup and start refactoring? Um, and it was bad originally. I had the <laughs> worst setup. For some reason, when I started, I thought it would be a great idea to say, OK, I'm going to take all my hooks, and I'll put them over here. And I'm going to take all my functions, and they're going to have their section over here. And just kind of did this bizarre lang by language division of things and ran with that for a decade. Um, and just only recently kind of stepped back and looked at some of the you know more uh, widespread open so, you know shared configs out there and was like, what have I been doing? This is awful. And so recently I uh, recently went back and just shuffled it back all around. So now it's like, okay, here's my Git setup. That's all in one place. Here's my C sharp setup. That's all in one place. And it's a lot more coherent. I used uh, Steve Purcell's setup as inspiration um, and just kind of things like that. I think just 
reading around and seeing what other people do and helps a lot. Yeah, it also yeah. helps to try to get rid of the crust. That's what I've noticed when I threw everything in an org mode file. It, it's just easier to kind of see the the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not right. That was... And, and, and another thing which I, I started doing after a post just ashes, I think, is I had a bunch of things which were uh, doing things with multiple... multiple you know, sort of uh, multiple key settings and probably using hydras for those and uh, there, there, there are now several more, you know, I, I did it just with a test of one thing and there are now several more and it's 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 a lot easier and simpler and um, so that was, so yeah, as you say, the, the looking around at what other people have done, uh, there, there, are some, there are some good examples out there now which is nice. And contributing to this, like other, what other people have done, is also really helpful. Um, Ian, if you if you find that your experience is like you you pick things up and then you get frustrated and and then you, you end up revisiting it maybe a year or two afterwards, uh, I do find that um, even for the things I haven't completely figured out, writing a blog post that kind of explains what I've got figured out so far and where I'm getting stuck is really helpful because. A, it gives me notes that I can refer back to later on, and um, and, and that way I don't have to have these partial things in my Emacs config while while waiting to figure that out. And B, often when I describe this like complicated thing that I'm trying to do in order to solve something, someone will pass by in a comment and say, "Oh, do you know about this like one line?" So I, you know, if you haven't blogged about this, this the challenges you're experiencing yet. Um, I recommend it. <laughs> yeah, actually, I only started using org mode in the past year or so for anything beyond simple outlining. Now that I'm a little bit more plugged in, it'd probably be a lot less uh, a lot less friction actually getting stuff posted online. So I may try and uh, get that loop working. I, I could always live stream my frustrations too. That might be a little funnier. I don't know. We might quite enjoy that. <laughs> yes. I don't know if that would be safe for work. Well, I uh, okay. Um, shall we? Does anyone else have any other interesting workflow tips, questions, ideas? Uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to mention. Uh, my name is uh, Swarup. Uh, as an introduction, um, I just wanted to thank uh, Howard. Uh, uh, because the last uh, Hangout uh, recording that I watched, uh, he mentioned Space Emacs, uh, and I've been, uh, you know, jumping into it, and I've added uh, uh, an ERC layer, and I just like my whole Emacs setup was completely changed for the better. So I just got to know about it because of this Hangout. So I just wanted to thank Howard and you know uh, Sacha and all of you for that. Wow, it, it looks like um, that the link that you posted into the text chat was. Space Emacs uh, support for C Sharp. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it looks pretty interesting as well. So maybe that will that will be helpful for you. Yeah, I'm not a Space Max user, but I'm definitely going to see if I can pull anything. And thanks for that. Thanks for that. Sure. Yeah, I actually haven't used it either, but I think I'd push it on people who are uh, coming over from uh, different worlds. Yeah, I uh, I had attended the first uh, Emacs uh, uh, San Francisco meetup uh, I think last week, and a lot of people are Vim users who are trying to look for uh, tips or something better, and they were at an Emacs meetup. And when I showed them Evil Mode, and they were like mind blown. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it it is really interesting. You know, we actually do have evil plans for taking over the world. <laughs> So Space Max is a you know so Space Max is is one of those like big packages configuration things. Has anyone else come across any interesting packages lately that might be useful to add to one's config? I came across a new pull request in Space Max for GNU Global. Uh, I never heard of that before, but apparently it does a really good job of uh, C tax kind of things. If I can find the link, I'll post it. 
Has anyone used uh, used uh, oh. no global? This is the GG tags that John Wheatley was talking about. Apparently, he's a big fan, and uh, and one one of these future hangouts with him. Um, he's traveling at the moment, which is why he couldn't make it to this one. I've got to get him to demonstrate this. Uh, but I hear it's very good for jumping around and finding things. Oh, cool! Uh, I plan to check it out too. You know, I've been completely forgetting to update my uh, org timer minutes for today's chats. <laughs> Sorry, let me go catch up now. <laughs> anyway, keep talking. <laughs> I, don't know, I guess I can add another thanks to the list for Howard because I've started to use um, his uh, tabling and org mode, doing the sums and keeping track of figures. So. I'm slowly migrating my weekly budget thing over to org mode. It's taking a bit of time, but I had no idea how to do it. And then I saw his blog post come up in RSS, and I thought, that's interesting. And then he demoed it in, in the Hangout. So I noted it all down, and, and it's working great. So thanks for that. Uh, well. Excellent. Maybe we should get Howard to demo more interesting things, like that uh, the uh, database interactions that he's just blogged about. <laughs> you want me to? You feel like going for it? I, I can. Bring it on. That way it gets recorded and other people can see it actually happening, assuming you have non-proprietary data to share it with. Yeah, let's hope so. <laughs> Let's see. Um, okay, so can everyone see my screen? Yep, I can see it. Great. So um, basically the trick that I found out, and I'm not sure if anybody had seen the blog post that I did, but you can set up these... Um, a drawer of properties and uh, the properties that I was using finally figured out how to get it all working so um, my database is running in a data center and I would SSH to the system and port forward 3306 the port onto my local host so that's why the the database host here is local host um, However, the trick that I needed to have was this line here. This is passing onto MySQL a command line saying, hey, use the TCP um, port since um, if the database, you know, if you put localhost, normally it tries to use a, a file system like Socket as opposed to actually TCP. So this was the trick that I could have so that um, I could actually do SQL statements. Um, yeah, so I can just hit Control C twice, and it'll go execute this SQL command through that connection and pull up the results in this table here um, that allow me to like, oh, let's see here, this image property one is pretty interesting. Let's run that. Oh, well, okay then. Here's all the details about, you know, the columns and the types, and it kind of gives me some ideas, and it's like, oh, well, I also want to know this one, so let's take a look at that. This has a lot more in it. Um, you know, and all of these, you know, in this case, it's passing it directly into MySQL, so you can use all the MySQL kind of stuff that, uh, you know, the, the crazy backtick stuff or whatever MySQL needs. I generally try to keep my um, SQL pretty straightforward. Um, but it, you know, and then the nice thing is I can name these things and then I could do a spreadsheet like this where I can grab that information and then from the different queries and then like in this case, I'm dividing them so that I could find out the number of properties per images as I was trying to investigate this uh, database. So how's that? Any questions? <laughs> Super cool.
yeah, it certainly saved me a lot of time as I could just run through this. And I even did it with a, with a couple of colleagues uh, where we were bantering back and forth as um, regarding as like, oh, what about, you know, doing this kind of a query? And I could just type it up in real time and save it and, and show it. Uh, show the results and then we could discuss it and analyze it more and keep on going. So yeah, I've got, uh, uh, yeah, I thought it was a, a fantastic idea. Yeah, that's really neat. I've, I've just started on a new code base which is um, six years old and you know, every, every, everything you would expect from that really. And uh, I, I had, you know, it, and it's a Blue Dawn Mills thing, and I, I had talked with Tasha about that directly execute code from snippets and org mode thing, and now I'm reminded of that. I want to get, I mean, there are all sorts of, you know, I, that was very useful because I'm, <laughs> tomorrow I'm going to be doing quite a bit of, I, I expect I'll have a go at doing quite a bit of that. On, on this code base and on the data in it, and so that was a, a very useful reminder. Thank you. I can do a package if you guys want. Bring it on. Uh, assuming no one has shown the new uh, Stack Exchange package yet, have you seen sx.el? I think it just came out this week. Go for it. Haven't seen it this yet. One's, this one's nice because it does not require a change in your workflow or anything like that. Let me share my screen. It's real simple. All right. Hopefully, you're seeing my screen now. Yep. Go so for it's it. just uh, sx.el. It's uh, on Melpa. Uh, I've already got it installed, but let me just show you really quickly how it works. The GitHub link. Before I forget, let me throw the GitHub link into the chat just so you guys have it. There you go. Um, okay. So basically, you get a bajillion different commands. Um, I don't even know what half of them are, and I don't even have shortcuts down yet. But the big obvious one, so it's sx is the prefix. And uh, the big easy one is tab all questions, which uh, first uh, prompts you for a Stack Exchange um, site. So obviously, we're going we're to go look at the Emacs Stack Exchange. Uh, pops it right up. And this all interfaces with their API and uh, just pulls up the same data that you would see sitting on their website, but it gets you a super, super quick, easy interface to actually browse stuff. Um, so, for example, I can say, and you, you can ask questions, you can reply, you can go to comments. So let's say, okay, how do we remove a link in org mode? Um, you know, just hit return and go look through there. So here's the question. Uh, someone's asking, you can either click on the add a comment button or uh, run whatever command uh, C, I guess, is the shortcut to uh, comment on it. I have no idea, so I'm not going to comment. Uh, but then you can see down uh, to where someone's actually answered, and you get your answer right there. Uh, so that's actually a really cool use case just for Emacs questions is, you know, going and actually searching uh, Emacs on Stack Exchange and pulling stuff up really quick, really, really quickly. And then when you're done, you back out, you can go to something else, or just you know quit out and go back to whatever you were doing. And that's it. So you can grab it from Melpa, and you know they've got all kinds of uh, fancy commands that let you get into it more quickly. So if you want to say, okay, I just want to look at straight at this tag in this uh, this subsection or whatever, um, and then really really easy upvoting, really easy downvoting, which is a little bit scary. It's just single keys for each of those. Um, and really easy commenting and asking questions and whatnot. So if you need, if you use Stack Exchange and a really efficient interface sounds handy, that's kind of a neat little standalone package. I thought it was fun. That's awesome. So this reminded me of a package I'd heard about before that searches code from Stack Overflow and pastes it into Emacs. Um, it turns out it's called how do I dash Emacs, where you just type in where your question is and you hit, you call the command. And it pastes in whatever code was in the answer of the thing. Um, so yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know that is one of the beauty things about um, about that sort of thing is you can easily hit a Control X Control E if the code happens to be, you know, Elif's code. Don't know about running anything else though. 
Yeah, I think the, the how do I Emacs is really just for pasting things in. So it's kind of like you can do the stack sec exchange search. Actually, the, and the interface there looks really slick, which is cool. Um, or you could just kind of, I'm feeling lucky, the stack overflow answer. <laughs> OK, so I've installed this um, stack exchange. Uh, what was the first command that you kicked off to get it going? Sorry, so the initial setup, there's actually a quick setup step that you have to do. I think it's documented on the, actually, you can probably just run that first command. It was, uh, hold on, it's SX tab all questions. Let me give you the screen share here real quick. Uh, uh, uh. You see it right here? Got it. I'm running it myself right now. And that should prompt you. I think it'll pop your browser open and make you do a uh, get it, grab an off token, but then it should work. Brilliant. Thanks for thanks for that. No problem. Sean, since you mentioned Hydra, um, I'm not sure if other people have come across that yet, but what are some of the things that you use Hydra for? Um, well, there was the initial. Th I, I forget which one it was now for, but there's the there was the thing for um, opening all sorts of projects and and subdirectories. Um, you know, there are various directories. There's um, other blog node subdirectories. So there's one for that, which is probably the largest one. It's got ten or twelve. In. And what else? Hang on a second. Uh, oh, for some reason in Ruby tools, I wasn't getting um, the um, switch something from a symbol to a single quoted string to a double quoted string. I mean, there were some abbreviations. Really you know, there there was a command, but the keyboard shortcut was not quite working for me. So I added a a Hydra for that as well, which is probably more Ruby really specific than anything else, and. Oh, there was mood switching. Um, I started watching the John Weedley thing, and I'm sorry, I may not be pronouncing his, his name correctly, and was looking at adding Paradit mode and other things, and I have my org mode, um, uh, my Emacs file in org mode, and putting it into Emacs list mode after that, I was I was unable to uh, do the org Babel tangle and and have it exported. So I just added something to quickly. Should, you, should you be using Control C apostrophe? Sorry, Control C quote in order to edit source blocks instead of switching to Emacs mode. And have it pop up in a separate. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I could do that too. I could do that too. Well, it allows you to kind of uh, go to town on a special mode, you know, for each individual language. The other thing you can do is you can always clone an indirect buffer. So that lets you mess about with your mode while still keeping another copy of the same buffer in the original mode. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Oh, lovely. Yes, okay. And because it's because the source is defined as Emacs list but anyway, the other buffer goes um, on control C quote the other buffer goes is in the correct. Lovely, neat. Okay, thank you. That was, uh, that, that, that was more of a demonstration of ignorance than a demonstration of uh, of anything. No, that's uh, that's totally cool. That so thank you. I find that it's only when you start explaining what you do that other people are like, yeah. what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> As you said earlier, you could do this other thing completely simpler. Yeah. Would anyone else like to have this like enlightening experience? <laughs> Yeah, I still don't have enough uh, Hydra lines. Um, just what's on the standard thing, but those are useful enough. What other things are you, are people trying to to learn or improve about Emacs? Like, what are what are you getting the hang of?
Uh, well, I recently started moving uh, stuff over to Cask, um, <clears throat> where Cask is basically a way to have a file that says, I want these packages installed, and then you run a command outside of Emacs to install them all. Um, and I don't know that I really have any, you know, problems with it right now. Just, you know, it's just brand new to me, but it's it's something that's pretty cool because it's a lot more declarative um, than, like, going in by hand into the uh, list package list packages buffer and saying, oh, install this one, install this one. Um, and you can update everything pretty easily. Um, so I've been having fun with that, too. Yeah, I've been wondering if I wanted to change over since um, I've, you know, got ancient Lisp little functions that I've been using forever uh, to do that same thing. It's I just whether it works. I, I was. Um, well, actually, I was using um, a bad source. Um, the load packages thing from from Batsol's configuration, and then I needed to use Earth Runner to run run tests on Emacs list code, and and that's how I ended up switching um, a, a few months ago. So I'm also um, new on that, and uh, and and enjoying it. Um, I just I just put the SX thing into my into my cast file as we were speaking earlier, so that's uh, that was uh, simple and straightforward. I'm real partial to the use package since it also allows me to, uh, in addition to defining that, um, in addition to declaring that my Emacs should install this package, it also lets me group my config for that package. It, which just has a neater syntax and eval after load. So uh, I'm, I'm still using it in the wrong way. Um, based on this other hangout that I recorded with John Weigley, he's gotten his Emacs boot up time to some like really low number, a really fast speed, whereas I'm still like, load everything, right? Uh, but uh, use package might be another thing to, to look into if you're looking into the, uh, you know, say, say this is so, the package so I you- want. So, Sasha, are you um, installing this use, pa- or you're setting up the use package calls uh, in multiple locations based on what you're then declaring? Is that how you're using it, oh, did you say? Uh, so the way that I use it for what basically people, I guess, are doing using Cask for it is I say, you know, use package, then the name of the package, ensure T. Um, and the ensure says, basically, if the package hasn't been installed yet, go and find it and install it. So that's kind of the dependency of, uh, of, of Cask, I guess. Uh, and then there are all sorts of things you can do. You can tell it to do, like, you know, only do the system type is Windows or Mac or whatever. So there are lots of things you can do with it. But it's, it's kind of like, by the time... Um, that Emacs, like, Cask is great if you want the packages to be there and the, you have this, like, lovely environment that you can test things in very quickly. Um, and um, and you, you don't want to, I guess, pollute your... Like, if you're testing things a lot, you want to be able to have these different environments to test in. Whereas use package, I think of more as a just convenience to get around the package installs. Yeah, it kind of sounds like my homegrown solution. Use package because I haven't actually started using it yet. But when you're talking about you define a package and um, set the value to true, so if it's not there, um, Emacs will go and find the package. Does it automatically know how to query, say, an alpha and pull the package from that, or is that something you have to define um, oh, for you to use? Yeah, I set it up. Um, let me increase my font size here. Uh, so I <laughs> visible now. There are bugs. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you still have to set up your package archives. In this case, I get things from Melpa, um, and and then from there you can say use package ensure t, and that says if I'm in a system that doesn't have auto compile, go and in, go and install it. Now of course you do actually have to have the use package package itself installed first, <laughs> but um, but once it's there, then you can use this, this nice syntax for everything else. Excellent. It's just because um, I, I guess like a lot of people I'm using Git to, I haven't gotten to the stage where um, 
I'm using like all Babel or anything to manage my config, so I'm still just using the .emacs file in my home directory for the time being, just till I come to grips with things. So obviously I use Emacs on my work machine and then at home on, on my machine. So, you know, and they both have use package already installed. So if I find something cool and install it at home, you know, I want to be able to just like commit that to yeah. to get them to come home, just update and, yeah. you know, there's, voila. There's certainly <laughs> that too. It's different ways. But yeah, I do have um, uh, the same set of uh, initialization scripts that work on all of my devices, and all which are different OSs even. And it is nice that whenever one of them crashes, it doesn't take long to get back to sanity. Uh, question about use package, which I I don't see this answered on its on its page. Does it update? the packages for you? Like, once it's installed, if in a week a new one is released, do you get the new one? Uh, no, it doesn't do that automatically, because that's kind of scary, I guess. But um, I've heard good things about using Paradox to update things asynchronously. So so uh, that might be something to look into. Paradox? Okay. Yeah, the problem, though, is depending on your uh, source, uh, you could get something that doesn't quite work, and then everything goes yeah. to hell quickly. So that's why it's scary. <laughs> I, I only do an update of all packages when I know I have an hour to kill. <laughs> hey guys. And I guess that's an argument for going the gateway. <laughs> What's going on? Hey. What's up? We were just talking about interesting um, packages that people have come across and uh, installed, and and also package management. So we went into a discussion about use package and cask and whatever. So uh, welcome. Is there anything in particular you? It is also totally okay to lurk until uh, next topic of conversation comes up. Okay. Does anybody want to talk about Tupac? The what? Tupac. Everybody says he's still alive, but I'm not sure. Mm. Okay, so let me rephrase. Uh, another Emacs-related topic of conversation comes up. Okay. Although you can probably relate Emacs to everything. So let's give it a try. How would you relate Emacs to Tupac? Well, I don't know. I, I don't know what Emacs is. Okay, so this might not entirely be the hangout for you unless we want to convert him. <laughs> Does someone want to explain? How did you come across this? Uh, Hangouts. Ah, I see. Okay, so we are talking about a uh, rather flexible and, and uh, quite powerful text editor, but it is a little unusual. So if you search for Emacs, E-M-A-C-S, then you can go explore that. But um, it might... I didn't know. Is this something in, like, a short hangout? <laughs> There is apparently an Emacs song. Has anyone heard this Emacs song? I think Zachary might have. What is going on there? No, I just did a quick search and uh, just found the lyrics. Uh, <laughs> on, on the wow. And unsurprisingly, a lyrics mode. <laughs> oh, wait, I have a cat. All right. Uh... In that case, let us carry on then. So, uh, okay, um, Emacs packages, interest, you know, workflow questions, ideas, that sort of thing. So I've got a question. Yeah. I'm relatively new to packages. I just started using list package and etc. a couple of months ago. Are people using just Melpa or Melpa stable? Um, and now you're starting to see kind of the interesting dynamics here. Yeah. Uh, since um, you know there are some that are very stable that you know that ne that seldom get updated, and others that uh, get updated with every Git commit. So it 
one thing that you'll notice is if you add multiple sources, like I've got four in mine, uh, when you do a list package, you can sometimes get four different entries, you know, that are different versions. So you can kind of choose which one you think is going to be the best. Because uh, sometimes you want the latest version, and other times you just want something that's safe. So, yeah, real mix. Yeah, um, I often find that for the most part, uh, the latest version works okay. Just, yeah. you know, sometimes it takes like, uh-oh, this one's not working right. Something uh, slipped through a git commit, so backing up, you know. And the thing that really threw me when I first started was that, and it surprises me, that packages are loaded after the .emacs is run. You, uh, can, uh, you can set up your config in eval after load or things like that. Yeah. Um, or if you know, or you can use package initialize to get them loaded before that. But the, but then it gets a little complicated. <laughs> and I guess use package solve some of this. Yeah, so use package, what it does is it will, it'll still wait for the package just to be loaded after your Emacs loads, but you can tell it to run certain code when the package is initialized or other things like that, or you can say, um, it kind of bind these keys and define the autoloads automatically, right. so that even if you're not using the package system, even if you're using, um, you know, uh, uh, packages that you've installed manually or that you have in a Git repository, at least it'll take care of the load path and the, um, and the whatchamacallits for you, the autoloads for you. I guess so. I've, I've just been using an old config for a long time that I've, you know, pruned every five years or so. And I did look at your last conversation about use pack, and I was like, all right, it looks fine. I'm not sure it's much better than what I have that actually yeah. works for me, but yeah. If, if your stuff works, keep it, right? I mean, right. people probably, like, people probably have um, configs that are decades old. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Hopefully we've updated them a little bit since college. <laughs> um, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> One of the things that I like about something managing it that isn't just going to the packages buffer list and manually going through and saying install this one, install that one, is you have this file that's like a record of it or a file that you can use. So if, you know, I go to my laptop, I don't have to say, well, I installed the package, that, you know, two weeks ago, what was it? I can say, oh, here's this file that, whether it's cache, whether it's use package or whatever, go and, you know, computer, you do it. You know, you're good at repeating things a lot. Humans are it. So that's one of the benefits of using some tool for it, whatever that tool is. Right. And even just the sheer, you know, I have a, you know, I, I just heard about this interesting package. Instead of having to go and hunt it down and, you know, add it to your low path and go compile it and all that stuff, um, it is nice just to be able to say package install or add it to the, the list um, and things like that. It has been pretty nice. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Stability-wise, I found Sarah. that Melpa is usually fine. Um, I only use, you know, the kind of really big packages, but I've never needed to hop on stable personally. Again, that's anecdotal. Um, you know, if you're, if you're really afraid of breaking changes, no reason you can't, you know, check the results into a repo or whatnot and get yourself the ability to roll back that way. Right. Yeah, well, you... I yeah, never have, I, but... You could. Yeah, whenever you uh, update packages, it asks you afterwards, do you want to delete them? And it always gets the latest one. So you can always just pop into the dot .emacs.d directory slash elpa and, you know, delete a problem child. So it's not a big deal, but... That's true, and you keep, if you, when you keep old versions, you can revert really easily, too. Yeah. Cool. But yeah, there. Uh, <laughs> with the internet and its proliferation that started not too long ago, um, getting interesting Lisp code for our Emacs uh, configuration files is is a big difference from uh, when I was in college and everything had to be handcrafted. Wow. I'm just waiting for the you know kind of uh, smart. Um, is that me? Yeah, that's you. Um, oh. I'm just waiting for the you know kind of 
automatic suggestions. Uh, people like you also use this Emacs list code. I mean, we should be able to do this kind of stuff now, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, excellent. That would be good. I don't think so. No? Oh, yeah, because then our yak shaving would be, like, rising yeah, high. Yeah, yeah, I wonder what this does. I mean... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, uh, I think we've all been guilty of that. That's half of the fun. Agreed. Well, now that Sam is here, we can th we can think about how we can, you know, if we're, we're trying to uh, moderate our yak shaving most days, how we could make a potential Emacs conference the most yak shavy of all days. <laughs> yeah, so how is uh, my sound coming through? Perfect okay? now, yes. Oh, cool. Oh, I didn't do anything, so... Um, Sometimes it takes a little bit to kind of uh, automatically adjust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, Sasha and I and like a bunch of people in the community are organizing an Emacs conference, and um, like I saw like Sasha's post, and like I emailed her, and she was like, "Yeah, well, if you're like an organizer like type of person, then you can put this together." And I'm like, "I'm not, but I want this to happen." So I've We've like set up like a bunch of infrastructure, um, and we're gonna stand up like a website today. Um, but the only thing that I like ask of you all is to uh, let people know that EmacsConf is going to happen um, like August twenty second, probably in the Bay Area because that's where we're at, and that's and where online because. Like, all the people. Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> totally. Like it'll be in the Bay Area. Like we want to do like a live stream. Um, and if people wanted to organize local meetups too, that's yeah, totally cool. Yeah, that would be sick. That would be super. But cool. you'll you will definitely start out the tech thing. So if we do have live speakers, they can you know, and and if you have virtual speakers, then kind of cross thing works out. Yeah. Um, well, well, of course, all the cool conferences come to Portland, Oregon. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, those. Yeah, that was our first choice, but things just didn't work out. No, um, no, I, I, I'm teasing. <laughs> yeah, I know. In, a, um, in a text chat, Saad confesses to be an actual organizer type person. So. Oh, wow. Experience. Hmm. That would be awesome. Yeah, so I, um, I have a form that I just posted the chat to the chat. And so this is just like an interest form. The only like required field is your email, so um, I can email you like as like the plan like unfolds. Um, but yeah, so Saad, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, but yeah, you should if you fill that out, I will get in touch with you, and like we should like be working together. So the hope for this is that everybody like like Emacs Conf is going to be awesome. Um, and we'll also be setting up the infrastructure for Emacs Conf to be easy to put on the next time, like we want to do a conference. Yeah. So, the, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. On the uh, survey or interest form, uh, it's asking how likely will you go? Does that yes. mean in person or virtually uh, or both? So for that, I was thinking in person because I was thinking um, like headcount for like Got how many it. people we would need a space for. Maybe. And I, is it too late to fiddle with a form to say, you know, uh, not, mm, but definitely if it's virtual, it's going to... Oh, yeah. yeah. Maybe a little so, bit of both. Yeah, I mean, I can totally, I can just add that when, like, whenever. I can do that soon. Yeah. And confused by the me. way... I'm easily confused. Yeah. Sorry. Um, no. Dylan, uh, if you're worried about being not qualified enough to present, I think it's really useful for people to hear from, like, not just people who keep talking about Emacs, but also people who are maybe figuring things out or trying to trying to understand things. Um, I definitely love a talk from a beginner if we can find someone that, who we can convince to, uh, to talk about that experience of getting into Emacs and, and trying things out. And probably, you know, well, intermediate users definitely have lots of things to share, too. Yeah, yeah, what definitely. What I've been doing to wet my feet a bit is I actually did a couple of blog posts just about... Um, getting an Emacs and the first couple of little things I've tried or the first packages and I actually chucked it up on the, the Emacs subreddit and I was getting a bit of interest from people obviously far more experienced than me but you know I put in there they give me feedback if I'm doing something wrong or right is there a better way so 
it's been really interesting to at least put myself out there as to where I'm at now and then slowly integrate all these awesome ideas that come across like these hangouts are always full of them. So if they ever manage to get to a conference in Australia and I can make it because their country is such a massive place, um, you know, I'll definitely go and do something even if it's like a 10-minute sort of flash talk or whatever and show my config and then people can take fire. And <laughs> Well, it would be nice to have uh, some big monitors with uh, like this Google Hangout and um, displaying all the real people who are asking questions as well virtually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so my baseline kind of plan, <laughs> evil plans, right? Yes. <laughs> worst case scenario is like you know the physical conference, you know, because it's we're actually it it's April. I was thinking August because it's my birthday, but really I'm yeah. completely wedded to this date. Um, anyway, um, worst case scenario is we have this nice long Emacs hangout where maybe I sit down and I just start reading through all the source code and um, all the interesting questions in Stack Exchange. <laughs> and other people can come and hang out with me and say, holy cow, I didn't know Emacs could do that, which is, of course, a moment you always have when you read through the manual or the source code. Um, and then if we want, if we get more structured, like people actually giving talks or people brainstorming around Emacs list for config or workflow, then um, then that's even better. But the baseline is there's going to be a hangout. <laughs> well, uh, it would be good to have it physical just because yes. I do owe you a beer, Sasha. Um, but other than that... I don't drink alcoholic vegetable, uh, vegetables. Okay. Remember this. <laughs> <laughs> that's a symbolic thing. Yes, hot chocolate. Here we go. Although I don't really know if you want me around Emacs and sugar at the same time, so this could be dangerous. Um, yes, and and definitely meeting a lot of Emacs geeks in person was the, one of the highlights of that 2013 conference. Because really, like 80 plus Emacs geeks in one room is kind of mind blowing. <laughs> so I would like the other people to have that experience as well. Yeah, uh, I mean I am super excited for it. Uh, yeah, I have to run in a sec because my work, like, we're sure. having, like, an event. Um, but, yeah, if any of you all um, are, like, interested in helping out, like, so, like, from, like, the Emacs community, uh, we need people who, like, want to give talks. And it's, like, like you all were saying, like, any, like, all perspectives on Emacs are interesting just because Emacs is cool. And so, like, um, like beginners, intermediates, like, John W level people, like all sorts of like skill levels, like everyone has something to contribute. Um, and then and sometimes people don't know what they can contribute, which is why we started putting together an outline of ideas. And if you recognize any of them, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk yeah. About, please do. <laughs> yeah, and then um, you just have to have my literate uh, DevOps thing on that list. That's it. That's, <laughs> that is on the list. That's my, yeah. that's my pet peeve for uh, months now. Yeah, yeah, it's on there. Um, and so let me post the site, but it's uh, emacsconf.github.io slash emacsconf2015, and that's where our plan is. So it's like a public planning document. Um, but we also need people, like, uh, to volunteer to, like, help us, like, corral all the cats in, like, the Emacs community and, like, I don't know, Emacs is like a community, like the community owns the editor, and the same is true of like the conference. Like anyone who wants to help out like can have a role. So just I'll, if you fill out the form, um, I can send you a quick email and uh, reconnect with you. But I do have to go. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Let me just post the link. Yeah, that was a little bit on the long side for that link. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. Great, thank you. But yeah, see y'all. All right. It would be really cool, you know, kind of yeah, get that, get that. Um, where is Emacs today? And 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 really just have more excuses to bring the community together because the Emacs community is like super cool. I'm also really curious about weird uses of Emacs. So, for example, I, I recently installed the eSpeakF um, speech synthesizer, and 
I remember using Emacs Speak to do stuff before, like read my mail to me. And I was thinking, you know, if I'm getting into yoga, it'd be really nice to have a, something like an org mode table with the poses and the times, and it would just tell me what to do at the appropriate times and then display this big timer. Because I couldn't find an app to do this. Anyway, so org mode timer. Org timer actually seems like it could do this trick. But yes, crazy uses of Emacs, right? That is, that's probably the craziest idea I've heard. Um, yeah, obviously, uh, it's easiest to write yeah. a Max so program. So, for example, I, I recently installed the e Oop, Someone's got a, OK, there you go. Oh, it's, it, I mean, it's structured, semi-structured data. And you can, you can like, you can play MP3s from, from Emacs using EMS. Yeah, I use it all the time for that. So I so, can do another funny org mode anecdote. Org, org mode is too easy for this because it reaches so far out of the editor. Um, so since I started uh, org mode, I started, uh, I, you know, I'm a lifelong uh, hobbyist musician, and I started bass in the past year. So I've been using org, org mode to track practice times and uh, org habit to poke me to actually practice on a regular basis. And it's really amazing. You know, the, the motivation to not see the red dot show up uh, really gets you uh, gets you moving, so it's been great for that. And I'm also using it for uh, getting back into strength training and actually tracking. You know, okay, am I lifting heavy things often enough, um, and that sort of stuff. So it's it's bizarre how uh, far outside of the realm of you know coding it started to reach. Um, you know, and obviously Emacs has always been more general purpose than that. But org mode, I think, kind of creeps its way into your life a lot more easily. I think um, it was yeah it was at the 2018 conference that I saw Sam Aaron's demo of Emacs Live, where I, he was real I think he was doing music in org mode. Nice. Yeah yeah because synthesizers and stuff and headings and anyway. Actually that that might be an interesting segment. Are there other crazy Emacs anecdotes that people have um, or want to share? Bye, Howard. Alternatively, we could just wrap up now, and so that people who are watching the replay don't have to sit through like three hours, well, two hours of people talking about Emacs. Uh, How dear. are you feeling today? Do you think Do you think we have more questions that we want to cover, or shall we wrap it up, uh, wrap it up here and and maybe see people again? And there's another one in two weeks, so if you have questions uh, between now and then, you can always bring it up then too. That, that, for me, that might be an idea. I've just started a new job, so I'm I'm less I'm I'm aware that I'm contributing less than I would like to be. So uh, I'm I'm good with that. All right. Any parting words? Any last minute uh, questions? I guess in two weeks, I'll hopefully get to take a crack at it before then. But I'm really interested in. Uh, whole moving your config to org mode and using Babel to pass it and that sort of thing. So I've only fleetingly read a little bit here and there about how it's done. I don't know whether I'll get time because of school holidays and work pretty busy, but if I don't make it then and someone has got it down pat and can able to demonstrate how they made that initial jump, I think that's the, the hardest thing for me is people demonstrate something like, oh, that's very cool, but you don't see the hard work and the changes and, and a little bit of piece-by-piece -piece configuration sort of adjustment they've done to get to that really good point. Mm -hmm. So, Is your yeah, config available on GitHub? <laughs> Is your config available on the internet? Because it would be fun to just fork it and, you know, kind of go through modifying it together. Uh, not yet, but I can do that. I, I can, I'll get it up on GitHub or something like that and people can have a poke around. There's nothing sensitive in it that I have to worry about yet, so. All yeah. right. We can table that as an interesting thing to explore during the next one or the next next hangout. Excellent. Yeah, no, I, I, I may have done that the most recently because I did it about a month or two ago. So, so yeah, I could I could certainly, you know. For, for me, the, the, the pain points and the how the, how the hell does this work is, is might be... Might be the most recent, so I can I can talk about that in two weeks if. Uh, yeah, sure. Awesome. Okay. The, the next one is. Let's go ahead. 
Oh, sorry. I was, I was just going to say, is um, for this conference that you guys are doing, um, I'm more than happy to help out with in any way I can here. Um, I'm, yeah, I, I just wondered if you've got Google Docs or anything that you're using. Are you using shared, shared Docs for that? or? Uh, well, there's a GitHub repository, which I have transferred to. Uh, oh, no, it's naturally, that. it's an org file. Again, you know, I've, I've transferred it over to the EmacsConf organization, one word. So if you search for EmacsConf on GitHub, you should find it. Um, okay, cool. And then you can either just <laughs> submit patches, I don't know, <laughs> email me if you have problems with that uh, sort of thing. Um, no worries. Yeah, so... I'd, I'd be keen on, um, uh, as I say, and if Dylan's also keen, um, having something local, um, yes. more local to, to our, our end of the um, globe. And I, it, it would be probably wise to sort of um, Make something that's sort of consistent with 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 your one as well, and um, yeah, yes, maybe works sure. Yeah, and that was one of the things that I, I you know, every time I hear about the interesting things that are happening in the London and New York meetups, and and I guess San Francisco now has one too. I was like, Ooh, I want everyone to be able to enjoy those experiences, no matter where they are, or even if they're o the only Emacs user in a hundred kilometers, which Dylan may not be true, I mean, depending on how far I saw this right. <laughs> Well, I do, you, <laughs> <laughs> do you do you have any idea, Sasha, how many Emacs users there are globally? I know this is like impossible. But I have like, no are we idea. Talking thousands or, would anyone like to hazard a guess? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah. more than eight. <laughs> more than eight. <laughs> more than eighty. Uh, probably at least. That's, Knowing your market is probably the, yeah, yeah, the well, first thing you learn uh, venues I don't know, maybe tens of thousands? I don't know. Um, but I, I don't know how many people would, would travel or, or attend live. But my hope is that if it's recorded, then it becomes a resource that we can come back to and, and take a look at. And especially if it's, if it's streamed nicely, then we can actually see the screen, because sometimes video is a little harder to, to see. Anyway, so that's um, it. Would be it'd be great to just make that a resource that, that people can share afterwards as well. Oh, uh, actually, and and also just to capture it, so that in case someone's listening to the recording and knows the answer, we can you know uh, you can answer them. Uh, somebody was asking earlier about when you would use Cask and Package El together. Um, but since people are were on the way to wrapping up, then we can either just wrap up now and people can answer in the comments on the event page if you happen to have a good thought out answer for that. Um, or if you have a quick answer, you can sneak it in and then say bye. No quick answers. Okay. Uh, nothing from me. <laughs> I, I, right. I still haven't finished watching the 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 thing from uh from earlier this month, so I, I, yeah. All right. In that case, thanks to people who joined us for a very early morning in some parts of the world and um, afternoons and evenings elsewhere. Uh, the next Emacs Hangout is on April 30 at uh, uh, t -t 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 8 o'clock p.m. Central Eastern Time, which is maybe 2 p.m. Toronto time and 6 p.m. UTC. Uh, and then there's one after that, but it'll be announced on the, expre the um, Emacs conferences and Hangouts Google Plus page. We have a Google Plus page now. So if you're not on the mailing list, you can go find the mailing list from the event page. Uh, and there will be a link to kind of where to find out more information. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks a lot. Thanks. See you guys. Thanks. Great. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. All right. Bye. Great. Bye.